So, um, please join me in welcoming Gabriel Anderson. Uh, his title is, of his talk is titled, Recovery of Coral Cover at Lizard Island, Australia, Six Years Post Disturbance. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Gabriel Anderson. I'm a fourth year marine sciences undergraduate at Cal Poly uh, down in San Luis Obispo, California. In my project, I was looking at the recovery of coral cover at Lizard Island, which in Australia, uh, six years after a wave of disturbances. So to give a little bit of background, I'm sure we're all somewhat familiar with disturbances. Um, as climate change continues to increase the spatial and temporal scales and also the frequency of disturbance events, um, and combined with anthropogenic influences such as fishing, uh, pollution, and other direct impacts, uh, it really does reduce the recovery of time scale, uh, the time scales of recovery for coral reefs and other ecosystems around the world. And specifically with the Great Barrier Reef, there's been increasing stressors. Um, this is just a little uh, graphic I grabbed uh, showing how in the 20 years before the 21st century, there were roughly six major disturbance events. Um, and then in the 2000 to 2020 range, there are roughly 10. And going forward, it's projected that in the next 20 years after that, there's gonna be 15 to 20. And so you can see there's going to be an exponential increase. And so it's really important that we understand how these coral reefs, especially in my case on the Great Barrier Reef, are changing under these conditions. And uh, this was mentioned in the first talk uh, at the conference. Um, but when it comes to disturbances, there's generally two broad pathways that ecosystems can go. And so you have your pre-disturbance condition, they undergo some kind of disturbance, like maybe bleaching in this case, and then there's some kind of response. And in this case, um, in this example, there might be a phase shift or a significant decline in diversity, and that would be considered degradation. Um, and then in other cases, you can have them undergo those same stressors. Um, but in, they might be able to actually recover. And so those are the two main, I'm gonna be using these icons throughout the presentation to kind of like show when I think there may be some degradation or some recovery occurring. Um, and then yeah, to go back to the Great Barrier Reef. So I was at Lizard Island, uh, which is off the coast of Queensland in Australia on the Northern Great Barrier Reef. Um, and it was established in 1973 to basically be a place where representative research can be done on coral reefs um, in that part of the Great Barrier Reef. and. I was specifically interested because I found out that when I was there in November of 2023 last year, there had actually six years prior been a four year wave of disturbances where there were two cyclones, uh, two years of cyclones, followed by two years of mass bleaching events. And so this led me to wonder if six years was enough time for the corals there to recover from previous wave of disturbances. And so my methods, I uh, adopted the same methods as past surveys of the island have been done so I could compare it to historical data dating back to 1995. Um, Madden et al. 2018 was the study that was done immediately after those disturbances. And so that allowed me to see a before and after picture as well. Um, but I did 10 meter point contact transects that were at least two meters, if not shorter, um, depth. And I did six transects across eight reefs around the island, as you can see here. The black dot is indicating where the research station is. And then these were each of my different sites with their names. And these are the names that are just used on the island to refer to the different reefs. They're kind of just, they kind of just came up with the names on their own, but that's just what everyone uses. Um, and I identified all the living stony corals to family. And then I had some other substrate categories like macroalgae, crustose coralline algae, sand, and what have you. And I'll be showing this map again later. Um, but to summarize what I found, this uh, was just the 2014 data. And I have the total live coral cover proportion on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is each of my different study sites. And I have on the bottom to orient you, it's ranging from north to south um, across the island. And after that four-year wave of disturbances, as one would expect, there was a pretty significant decline in cover at each of the sites. Um, and, I, and then when I went out in 2023, there was actually pretty significant recovery at, at all the sites, um, with six out of eight of them actually going above pre-disturbance 2014 levels, which was exciting to see. Um, and I'll discuss more why I think those other two sites may not have recovered as strongly. Um, and then here I looked at the fam, the, these are the predominant families at Lizard Island, um, Acroporidae, Postlepidae, and Peridae. And then starting in 2011, researchers at the island started 
uh, looking at soft coral as well, so I also marked where that was, even though it wasn't the focus of my study, just to see how it fell with, in relation to these families, um, because that's often competing with cor uh, stony corals as they're undergoing these intense conditions and they tend to grow a little bit faster so they can be a good competitor for stony corals. Um, and yeah, as you can see here, the Acrophoridae family did have quite an upswing in the six years since that uh, disturbance may have happened. Um, and all the families did have an increase, um, but Acrophoridae, you can see it's returning to its more of its historical trend of being by, like the much more dominant family on um, the island. And then this, I looked at the coral cover proportion again, but this time by year, and I guess last year, last one was year as well. But um, you can also see that the overall grand means uh, across the island for each year uh, did rapidly increase uh, in those six years since again. Um, and so their relatively calmer conditions really allowed that overall cover to regenerate. Um, and then when I looked at family richness, I saw that it did actually recover from the post-disturbance level around um, 2.5, but by uh, 2023 it had yet to reach uh, pre-disturbance levels, so this may signal that there might be some more homogeneity, um, which probably raises some red flags, as you saw all of the talks before mentioning the importance of that diversity for maintaining reef resilience. And as you may notice, my data point that I added here from my surveys doesn't have noticeable error bars, and that's because no matter how much I shrank down these data points, uh, my error bars were so small, and that's because there truly was just such little variation amongst my sites compared to the others, and so that's likely a sign of some uh, diversity degradation. And um, what I found is, as you saw in those past graphs, there was a lot of recovery in my northernmost sites up in Mermaid Cove and North Reef, but down around the lagoon sites, um, they, had yet, they had not yet reached their pre-disturbance coral cover. And I think some potential factors in this could be because of uh, those two sites being much more uh, protected inside the lagoon, as opposed to these other ones that are more uh, exposed to regular wave action and more constant um, pressures. Um, that may have led to some nutrient accumulation because of the reduced wave action and the predominantly sandy substrate, which doesn't really favor the recruitment of large stony reef building corals. And some other confounding factors to why I may have found this trend is because as a student researcher who just got their Australian boaters license, they didn't want me going out alone to this side of the island because as you, it's like on the other side and as you can see, it's out of, or as you can't see here, but there's a big mountain in the middle and so you're out of radio contact and because of the prevailing southeast trade winds, it's very stormy conditions over there and so they just didn't want me to go survey over there on my own and because of that, there were 11 other sites that had been historically surveyed all along this perimeter that I was unable to go to, so that also would likely have greatly clarified if that was a real trend or not, so I'm taking this one with a grain of salt. Um, but overall, it seems like there, was, there has been some recovery. 75% um, of my sites, as of November 2023, did have uh, dominance of acroporids, um, which were, as you saw, the most abundant family on the island, um, dating back to 1995 at least, um, and they had a 95% decline during those disturbances and actually became the least common major family immediately after that uh, disturbance wave. And then by 2023, they actually experienced, um, they contributed to a large amount of that percent recovery, um, as you can see, 34 to 60%, whereas the two lagoon sites were around 16 to 18% recovery. And there are some concerns raised by this more homogeneous um, reef composition because uh, crown of thorn starfish, which are a big uh, threat to coral reefs on the Great Barrier Reef, um, are shown to prefer acroporidae uh, corals as their preferred prey, and so um, they like that, that makes them a big target for that, which currently there's efforts to control crown of thorn starfish populations, but they're not super successful. It's kind of a similar story to urchins and kelp here in California, or on the west coast. And um, another th myth spreading on the Great Barrier Reef is acroporid white syndrome, which acts similar to bleaching in that it ultimately results in the coral expelling their symbiontes and belly. And so it kills the corals on the spot just the same. And they also are highly susceptible to bleaching. And another thing I forgot to put on the slide is that they also, as you can see up top, these are what the, the most recovered sites look like um, with a lot of acroporidae tabular and branching corals. And because of that, um, they tend to be less structurally uh, strong compared to um, Postlephoridae and Paridae corals, which are more boulder-like. 
And so in terms of cyclones and just general um, larger storm events, they also tend to break down a lot more easily. So that's another concern. But for the future of coral reefs, um, as these disturbances are getting more frequent and intense, and uh, globally, ecosystems, including coral reefs, are facing these evolving stressors, um, it's really going to be changing the assemblage of our reefs. And some species may survive better under new conditions, whereas others may not. And in order to better understand this, as, as we all know, coral reefs are declining pretty significantly globally. And without regular monitoring of such sites like this, we can't better understand how these community-wide shifts are occurring. And as we know, these disturbances aren't going away and they're only going to continue happening more frequently and intensely. And because of that, it really makes it important that we understand in what ways these communities are shifting so we can try and build their resilience going forward. And just specifically on Lizard Island, just to review what I found, there was at least 40% live coral cover at all the reefs um, before that disturbance wave. And after that wave, there was no greater than 4% cover at any of those sites. Um, but by 2023, there was a range of 18 to 60% increase. But um, the 75% that had the greater recovery were mostly actually closer to 40 to 60% recovery. Um, and then again, I think also because of that Acropora Day cover, even though it's not a great long-term metric, I think it could be useful in the short term to indicate how these reefs are doing as an intermediate recovery metric, because again, as these disturbances are happening more, there may not be time for a full scale of recovery, and so they could still be useful in the short term, which may be important. And this will help us better understand which families and species persist versus perish. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, the 